Welcome back, everyone. Welcome, Gudmundur Palmasan, uh, CEO of Strax. Uh, uh, very nice to have you here. Um, and uh, I think we, uh, we want to make uh, the mo most out of your presentation, so please go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, I have to do this in English. Uh, I hope you all understand. If not, please feel free to translate through Robert later on if there's something that needs further clarification. But one thing I want to say right away is the name Strax is not the Swedish name Strax, which means soon. This is actually an Icelandic name, Strax, and in Iceland it means immediately. And that was sort of the original concept in a different industry than accessories, that you had to act immediately on the opportunity or forget about it. So that's sort of the, the the, uh, has been sort of a part of the company from day one that we act quickly on our opportunities and exit quickly at the same time. Uh, in principle, Strax, we operate in consumer products. We develop, uh, acquire, and divest uh, consumer products, mainly in three product categories, mobile accessories, and these are cases for your mobile phones or charges for your mobile phones personal audio products, which are our headphones and speakers. And then uh, sort of as a result of the pandemic, we were forced to think outside the box and we entered into a, a category that was in, in obviously high demand, uh, uh, personal protection equipment. And we pivoted a part of the organization as a survival means into sort of the health and wellness category. The size of the business, trailing 12 month sales, 116 million, Euros, we operate at anywhere between 8 and 10 percent EBITDA margin. And what's sort of unique about Strax and why, and one of the reasons why we can bring products to market fairly quickly is the distribution reach we have. So we have access to 75,000 points of sales globally, meaning retail doors, anything from Telia or Elsheb in the Nordics to AT&T, Verizon in the US. SoftBank in Japan and elsewhere. So this gives brands that we take or acquire or launch pretty good access uh, to market fairly quickly. Throughout the history, we've been very acquisitive. So we've acquired brands, we've acquired distribution businesses, and we've also managed to sell a business in the last few years, which I'll get back to later. So we are mobile accessories and personal audio products are a sub-segment of smartphones. Smartphone sales sort of historically, at least for the last three to five years, have sold roughly 1.5 billion devices per year. We've had a, a hiccup in the industry, obviously due to COVID, but the market is expected to come back to growth this year, subject to, of course, shortages of chipsets, which is impacting many of the vendors, and then expected to grow again next year. Hopefully this will materialize because personal sort of Obviously, cases for mobile phones won't sell unless there are new phones in the market. We also look at the universe of smartphones out there, and we estimate there are roughly five, four and a half, five billion smartphones that are being used uh, at any given time in the world. So this is at least a pretty big market that we operate in. Uh, the accessory market in particular is also a relatively large market. You see roughly 71 billion in retail value last year and is expected to, to grow healthy in the next few years. So we are, are operating in a market that is growing. And even though we've seen smartphones plateau in the last couple of years, uh, smartphones are still, no, accessories are still growing. Personal audio products are still growing. People are buying more accessories per smartphone sold. So it, it is a growing market, which is quite important. Uh, for us and sort of the future prospects of the business. Uh, yet another subsect of the mobile accessory business is the personal audio space, and in particular, the uh, true wireless headsets like the Urbanista uh, London's or the Apple AirPods. That is a typical true wireless product, has been tremendous growth in that category over the last five years and is expected to continue for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so. All in all, we are operating in a market that is growing, and there are plenty of opportunities for us to sort of grow within the industries and segments we operate in. Also briefly want to give you a synopsis of the situation today. 
and, and what we've been through in the last 18 months or, or since the uh, COVID really started. Uh, uh, activity in the M&A space, we haven't, we've been on the sidelines more or less since uh, back end of 19, pre-COVID, but the industry has been fairly active. We've seen transactions on the brand side at very healthy valuations. We've seen transactions on distribution side also at healthy valuations. So the underlying uh, industry is fairly healthy, both from a, a sort of sales growth, oper operating profit operations uh, altogether, and the M&A side as a result of that is quite, uh, quite healthy as well, which means that investors uh, really believe in the underlying category. Uh, COVID, Sweden has been, I would say, an anomaly when it comes to lockdowns. Uh, Sweden hasn't seen a single day of lockdown. But just to, again, context of the markets we operate in, the UK used to be our second biggest market, Germany being our biggest market. In the last 18 months, both of these countries have seen retailers lock the doors for over 200 days. In April and May 2020, more than 80% of our retailers were closed. And this is when we sort of pivoted, basically we had to, we, we sort of survival instinct kicked in and we really had to figure out a way, how do we really stay alive? And that's why we sat down, looked at uh, sort of immediate opportunity and health and wellness was an obvious choice for us. And we could more or less utilize the same infrastructure, the same organization we have and had in place for the existing businesses as we did for this new product category. And, and really last year we saw <coughs> a decline on the core business side of 24%, but we were able to pick the majority of, of, of that up through this new product category we launched uh, as a result of, of COVID. Uh, life is not always perfect. We see most countries open up the doors and now we're faced with new challenges. Uh, but I always say I have a word for that. It's called business. There are always challenges uh, that you face with every single day and you simply have to manage with them and around them and be creative and resourceful. And I think we've shown that throughout our history that we can be that if we have to. Uh, we operate a, a integrated business model. On one hand, we own brands, again, like an Urbanista, Ritzman and Fins, and a few others in the product category, categories we operate in. We also have a distribution business. So that's why we say it's an integrated business model where brands that we own or acquire benefit directly from having access to market through the distribution we own and control, uh, primarily in Europe and then with uh, a, a smaller teams in, in markets that are further away. But this integrated business model is, in our opinion, uh, quite important and, and, and is complementary uh, to one another. Uh, there are every now and then conflicts, but I think we've been pretty good in steering around those conflicts by owning brands on one hand and distributing competing brands. We operate with, uh, with uh, Chinese walls between these two business units. Uh, and we feel that the benefit far outweighs the, the costs of having an integrated business model. I'm gonna share with you here a, a sort of how this model really works in, in, in practice. So in 2015, we acquired a small brand called Gear4. We acquired it for roughly five and a half million euros on a very heavy earnout basis. Uh, sales of that brand at the time were roughly five million, so it was 1x sales. But we immediately discontinued their biggest sales and revenue driver in, in speakers and focused the brand on protection. We repositioned the brand and grew their sales on cases from 1 million to 24 million in a period of three years. And that was primarily possible because we had access to the markets. And then we later on sold the business uh, three and a half years later for uh, 34 million euros. And this just really shows the, the strength of having a strong go-to-market uh, organization like we do have on the distribution side. Our, our growth agenda is quite clear. Uh, we are in a um, industry or industries that are growing. We feel strongly that we can grow our existing brands within these categories, 
Uh, we are developing new brands and we've just launched two new brands uh, in the last uh, month and a half, which we are extremely excited about. And then we have to figure out a way how to grow in e-com. We have grown in e-com, uh, but it's been at a pretty hefty cost. Uh, I tend to say it's easy to grow in e-com if you don't have to think about your profits. To do it profitably is becoming more and more challenging, and that's why we've launched these new two, two new brands, which are digital native brands don't, that don't have continuous competition from offline and online, other on online and offline retailers. So we have a pretty good feeling that, that we have sort of the fundamentals in place to grow, and we have quite a scalable business model as well. Own brands, Urbanista is, is sort of the, I would say, the, the, the key brand in, in our portfolio. We acquired Urbanista back in 2014. It was a Stockholm-based uh, brand at the time, still operated out of Stockholm, but we've managed to grow Urbanista quite healthy since we acquired it back in 2014. There have been now a couple of challenging years, given that it's primarily a retail brand. And when the retailers had to close their doors, we obviously didn't sell. And we thought we could sort of pick up uh, business in e-com, which we did, but it came out, uh, as I said before, pretty significant cost. Clicker is another uh, brand. This is a, a stand, a simple stand. We, we own intellectual property around this, uh, this product. And the attachable, just to give an idea, you can use this stand on your phone. It's a universal product to either have it stand or, or sit in, 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 in horizontal mode, also for conferences. And, and if you're into the selfie game, you can use it for selfies. There's a comparable product out there called PopSocket. We feel this is a significantly stronger product because it, you have this horizontal mode as well to either create content or view content. And, and again, this is a category that's, in terms of market size, probably a five, $600 million uh, product category. Richmond and Finns, we acquired another Swedish uh, tech accessory brand. We acquired them back in 2019, in, in December 2019. We've sort of had to do a restructuring. We bought it sort of in somewhat of a, of a distress mode. And again, this brand has been negatively impacted by retailers being closed, unfortunately. But again, uh, we have pretty good feeling that we will be able to really uh, take this to market and, and grow the sales uh, once uh, we see retail come back to sort of pre-COVID levels. Exquisite is a, it's a somewhat of a stable brand as well. It's, uh, it's a, a brand that uh, sort of focuses on offering value, not the most innovative brand, not the most fashionable brand, just a brand that is needed in, in the portfolio and ranges of all of the customers uh, we have primarily in Europe, but it's also being sold in, in the US. Planet Buddies is a brand we, uh, Originally launched in Amazon, uh, strong feedback, uh, strong sales on Amazon, strong traction, got uh, sort of interest from a traditional retailer. So we've also launched it in, in, into the retail uh, uh, in both in Europe and US and, and really good feedback. And this is a brand that's primarily targeting uh, children with, with uh, accessories and simple products for them to be able to utilize technology products uh, that are sort of handed down to them by their parents or, 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 or their guardians. And again, quite interesting opportunity. There is nothing really out there uh, that is, is comparable. There are brands that sort of pivot into this category, but nothing really dedicated in this space and good feedback from the market on this product. This is uh, one of our latest brands we, we've launched in the true wireless audio category. We uh, collaborated with two CrossFit fitness athletes. And for those of you who don't recognize CrossFit, it's one of the sort of largest uh, franchise organizations in the world. They have 11,000 uh, CrossFit gyms uh, across the world. And the two brand ambassadors are Icelandic women that have been, each of them has won the fittest woman on earth twice. And the person you see on, on these images, she is one of the 50 most marketable athletes in the world along with Ronaldo, Messi, et cetera. So I think he ranks number 45. Their Instagram following combined is uh, three and a th I believe now 3.3 million. And this is a pretty unique opportunity for Strax to have a captured audience 
in the, the fitness and CrossFit world, but also have access to the, uh, the followers of these two individual athletes. So, so a great collaboration. Uh, we announced this a month ago, and the product will start selling on our website uh, now in November. So again, great opportunity. We just launched another True Wireless brand. Here we collaborated with uh, a person called Axel Grell. The brand name is, is Grell. Uh, Axel, uh, the uh, person we teamed up with, he was the key audiophile designer at Sennheiser in Germany, which is a globally recognized audiophile brand. Uh, we've also teamed up with a platform which is, uh, sort of gives us a much better chance of su succeeding with this brand. We teamed up with a, a US-based uh, company called Drop. Drop is a members club, basically seven million members, and we will do the Grell product co-branded with the Drop community. And, and uh, Drop uh, has had great successes with many sort of strong audio brands, and, and we will tap into that community. And this <coughs> makes <coughs> sort of the online, I would say, space much more attractive and, and easier for us to succeed in, where we don't have to continuously buy traffic through performance marketing, which is uh, the biggest cost of, of trying to build uh, an e-com brand. And both of these brands will be digital native brands, so we won't have them in traditional retail. We won't see price comp competition from regular retail or Amazon. Uh, Avo is a brand we launched uh, as a response to the pandemic. Again here, it's been pretty, pretty well received. Nothing really uh, must to be said about it. Focuses on health and wellness products. We also have a business in licensing. So we have uh, agreements with the likes of Adidas and Diesel, where we <coughs> have a global exclusive right to manufacture cases and products. And in the, in the, uh, for diesel, for example, we do headphones as well as speakers. So <coughs> it's, it's always nice when you have something that nobody else has. And, and licensed brands are typical sort of examples of that where you can go and open doors and then later on bring your own uh, brands uh, on, on sort of the tail end of, of having opened the doors with these brands. Other part of our business, not much to be said about it, it's typical distribution business. We have a centralized uh, warehouse in Germany. It's uh, a business we acquired back in 2005, fairly stable business and, and ha has even managed to stand on its own throughout the pandemic. This year, 65 million in sales, uh, or last year, and similar slight growth this year, but a very healthy and stable business. Uh, this entity or distribution business serves many of the brand names you recognize in the Nordics, the Telias of the world, the Telenos, Expert, Technik Magazine, Elship. These are all customers of the distribution group. So what would happen if <coughs> Urbanista is selling, let's say, to Telia, rather than going direct into Telia, they would go through Strax Distribution, which would then bring them into Telia as, as its standard distributor with a centralized warehouse in, in Germany. We've also expanded into a new type of distribution where we have a specialist company that focuses on global online marketplaces. And this is more of a service where we outsource the warehousing function and logistics. But this is a company that specializes in, 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 in listing on Amazon as a seller and also on promoting products on Amazon. And this is a company we acquired back in 2018 uh, and which is very much a part of sort of the growth uh, we're trying to capture in the online space. Uh, I'm not going to dwell much on, on the financials. You can see all of that in, the, uh, in uh, our quarterly reports and, and, uh, and the report, analyst report uh, issued by Penser. We have managed to grow in the last uh, sort of six, seven years, with the exception of, of last year, where we were negatively impacted by COVID. But still, a trailing 12 months, uh, ending in June this year of 116 million and 8.7 million in EBITDA. So we've been able to manage reasonably well or even well throughout pandemic uh, and hopefully that is now or very soon behind us uh, and we're just crossing our fingers that uh, business will go back to normal now in Q4 and then going forward. Uh, the investment case, uh, I always say this is a typical example of some of the parts where the sum of the parts 
is significantly more valuable than the whole. And this is uh, sort of the, the challenge we've had uh, as an investment opportunity is to really explain and cut through to uh, investors how to really look at Strax. Are we a distributor? Are we a, a house of brands? Uh, that sort of message has been the challenge. But if you would just look at uh, Urbanista as a part of the whole, and you would apply multiples that we've seen in, in M&A market in the last six months, on a standalone basis, Urbanista would be more valuable than Strax as a whole. And, and when we sold Gear 4 back in 2018, that was one of the biggest challenges we had with the prospective buyer. It, he always came back to this, why, why don't I buy just all of Strax? Uh, because it's less expensive on the market than Urbanista we're paying for. I believe we were valued at uh, close to 30 million euros uh, back in 2018, and we sold Urbanista for 34. And I, I firmly and we firmly believe that this is still the case if you would sort of analyze and apply value to the different parts of the business, you would get a significantly higher number than you see on the total business so on the market today. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Gudmundur. Um, I have uh, one opening question. When, when you how do you screen for brands? It is uh, somewhat opportunistic. Uh, uh, which you can argue is, is good or bad. Uh, if we see a, a brand that is in, in some ways underserved in a market and hasn't really been uh, successful for various different reasons, and we test the case uh, with uh, our distribution uh, entity, and if we sort of see that there is a need and, and more of a, a fit, we would engage. Uh, we, at the, so at this point in time, we don't feel that there are gaps in our portfolio. Uh, we're not really actively looking for brands, even though the, sort of the deal flow we see due to the track record we have is quite strong, but, but currently we're not really looking for something that we feel we need. We, we just launched these two new audio brands that we feel will, will serve a, a certain need in the market, which was based on sort of an analysis we conducted ourselves. Uh, so we take ideas from all, all uh, I would say, uh, all sides of the, of the, uh, of the coin, but, uh, and, and just then try to test concepts uh, and test products uh, concepts within our sales organization. And, and, and what do you bring to the table for, for the actual brand? Why would they, I mean, why do they come to you? What, what do you offer when they join Strax? Yeah. So uh, I've talked about the uh, REITs we have, so having access to uh, more than 75,000 retail doors. On top of that, we have a specialist company uh, for online marketplaces. And we also provide these brands, if they're smaller brands, with uh, quite significant supporting uh, functions. We have a, a, a team of 20 people in Hong Kong and, and Shenzhen in China. Uh, so if it's a small brand, they don't have to either outsource or have their own people on the ground. We provide uh, logistics services. We provide, of course, financial, financial discipline and, and reporting. So they gain a lot, not only the access to the markets, but also on the back end in terms of just uh, operational excellence and discipline. Okay, so, so just quickly, I mean, we shouldn't really talk about valuation too much, but just to come back to the Urbanista um, question w w that you compared with uh, the, the whole Strax. Um, how many, I mean, how many brand of your brands would you say uh, would, would see valuations with such a, a premium as Urbanista did uh, a couple of years ago? Uh, I think if you want to be successful in, in divesting, you have to have a certain size. Uh, brand that is generating anywhere between two and five million euros in revenue isn't really ready to be sold uh, at, at a sort of a, a significant valuation. Uh, Urbanista definitely is there already and has been there for the last uh, couple of years, even though it's been challenged due to the pandemic. We feel that all of our brands had a chance to sort of go to that 10 to 20 million uh, plus 
rains in the next two to three years. So yeah, we feel strongly about the, the entire brand portfolio. Uh, and, and the transactions I'm, I'm referring to, so we sold, when we sold Gear 4, it was at one and a half times sales. Uh, we look at sort of a peer group of either standalone brands or, or house of brands, companies that have multiple brands in their portfolio, and they're trading in the public markets at anywhere between two and three times sales. We have seen transactions in the private markets being executed in the last six months again in the audio space at three and a half times sales. And this is just the, the, the reality. Uh, but the Urbanista clearly is there already. Uh, we have the licensing businesses generating 10 million euros a year. That's also something that uh, sort of would attract nice valuations already because they have critical mass. They have a very good uh, sort of proportion of sales coming through online channels. More than 50% of their sales is online, which is also sort of in high demand now. So again, the whole sort of brand portfolio is, is sort of ready and positioned, of course, to grow when we see the, the, uh, the uh, markets come back and retailers really... Uh, open the doors and, and, and consumers ultimately get, getting in those doors and start buying. Okay, let's, uh, let's open up for uh, questions from the audience. Yes, uh, I would like to know what about interest to the shareholders? In terms of dividend distribution or? Yes. So okay, I'll, I'll just repeat that be, uh, uh, question because we need uh, for, uh, for the um, Okay. Uh, streamed audience also to get that. What about the interest from, from uh, shareholders? Uh, up until now, we've not uh, distributed any dividends uh, on a regular or analyzed div dividends. Uh, when we sold Gear 4 back in 2018, we distributed 12 million euros to the shareholders out of the proceeds from that transaction. So that's quite sizable. Uh, but the board up until now has not uh, sort of really taken a decision to have regular dividends. If we do divest uh, in the future, I would expect a, a big proportion of those uh, proceeds uh, to be distributed to shareholders. Any, any further questions? Okay, so... so um if we want to look at, at profitability levels, uh, we could see that the, the gross margin is, is fairly stable, uh, although we've had, I mean, troubles over the last two or three years. So, and then coming down to kind of EBIT levels, um, uh, understandably, the last couple of years is, has been a rocky road. How, how would you like us to, to see upon th these levels going long, long term? Long term, uh, we have a, a very scalable uh, business. So with uh, growth, uh, profitability should improve significantly. Uh, if you look at our cost structure, it is primarily fixed cost, save for, of, of course, cost of goods. But the o op OPEX is fixed, and we don't have to add much uh, in terms of resources to double the size of the business. And, and, and sort of contribution margin in that scenario will largely, or incremental co contribution margin, will largely trickle down to the EBITDA profitability. So it, it is quite scalable. And with growth, our profitability uh, as a proportion of sales will improve. But, but as uh, you talked a little bit about the... the, the um uh, the problems or, or um, um, yeah, the problems in, in building an e-com business. Uh, now, so I would suppose that you want to see volume growth in offline business at this moment uh, as opposed to e -com, the e-com business. Yeah, we, we want to pursue growth in both. We have a, a uh, sort of mid-term target of generating uh, half of our sales through online uh, channels. Both our own D2C branded websites through the online marketplaces, as well as through online uh, e-com, which is if we sell to an L-ship, again using them as an example, and they sell to their consumers through their online platform. So we, the target is 50% of sales through this uh, Th these three different online channels. Profitability-wise, uh, sort of our target is to generate similar margins in e-com as we do in offline business. 
we simply haven't had the tools to try to optimize uh, our e-com sales. We have been loss making in our e-com activities on a margin level, and you can just imagine sort of the impact on, on sort of EBITDA level if the margin, if you generate negative margin in e-com. And that's something we will have to have to improve and are continuously looking at. And, and this is also why we've now launched these two new audio brands, because we will not have competition from other retailers. We will not have competition from Amazon, because these brands will only be sold through our own D2C branded website. In addition to that, the other expensive part of e-com is performance marketing. Given that we have strong ambassadors on both these brands, and on top of that, we have access to communities they are associated with, we feel that the customer acquisition cost on these two brands will be significantly lower at higher margin, and they are absolutely critical for us to have a profitable e-com business going forward. Okay, great. So by, by that, uh, Gudmundur, thank you very much for joining us here in Malmo, uh, and um, have a safe trip back home. Thank you very much, thank you.